In this video, we will cover a very important topic in the field of financial economics called portfolio theory and also cover some of the concepts that have advanced the field of portfolio theory and asset management over the number of years. To begin with, the most logical question is, what is portfolio theory about? Portfolio theory is essentially about risk, return, preferences, and opportunities. Suppose we have three assets, A, B, and C. And let's say we know the expected return and volatility of each of the three assets. Comparing asset B to asset A, investors would prefer asset B over asset A. And the reason is that even if A and B have the same volatility, the expected return of B is greater than the expected return of A. Similarly, when comparing asset C to asset A, investors would prefer C over A. And that's because even if A and C have the same expected return, asset C has much lower volatility than asset A. So portfolio theory is essentially about maximizing a portfolio's return and minimizing its risk. Consider a portfolio with two assets, A and B, where expected return of asset A is greater than the expected return of asset B. And the volatility of asset A is greater than the volatility of asset B. Then the volatility of the portfolio with assets A and B equals proportion of asset A in the portfolio square times the variance of A plus proportion of asset B in the portfolio square times the variance of B plus two times A, B, volatility of A, volatility of B times the correlation between A and B. The right-hand side of this equation so far follows from the standard definition of variance of a portfolio with two assets, and we take the square root to compute the volatility. An important unknown variable here is the correlation between assets A and B. Let's suppose that the two assets are perfectly positively correlated. In that case, the volatility of the portfolio reduces down to the weighted sum of individual volatilities. In risk return space, the feasible set becomes this straight red line that connects A and B. And as we vary the weights of A and B in the portfolio, we move along this straight line. Now what if the correlation between the two assets is negative 1? So they are perfectly negatively correlated. In that case, the volatility of the portfolio reduces down to plus minus, because we are taking the square root to compute the volatility, A times the volatility of A minus B times the volatility of B which is greater than or equal to zero. Let the volatility of the portfolio be equal to zero. In that case, the ratio of A to B just equals the ratio of volatility of B to the volatility of A. In risk return space, the point on the y-axis where volatility of the portfolio is zero corresponds to correlation of negative one. At this point, A over B equals the volatility of B over the volatility of A. Finally, if the correlation between assets A and B in the portfolio equals zero, in other words, there's no correlation between the two assets, then the volatility of the portfolio equals proportion of asset A in the portfolio square times the variance of A plus the proportion of asset B in the portfolio square times the variance of B and we take the square root of this, which is less than the weighted sum of two volatilities. Question is, why is the portfolio volatility less than the weighted sum of volatilities? And the reason is that in any portfolio, the volatility comprises of two parts, the volatility of individual assets plus the covariance between assets, which comes in through correlation. 
when correlation itself is zero, there's no covariance between the assets, and hence, portfolio volatility will be less than if assets were perfectly positively correlated. In that case, the feasible set becomes this curved mean variance boundary that lies between the straight lines that connect A and B when assets are perfectly positively correlated and this point on the y-axis when assets are perfectly negatively correlated. So our feasible set is represented by this green curve boundary when correlation between assets is zero. So far we've been dealing with portfolios with two assets. Question is, what happens when the number of assets in a portfolio is greater than two? Let n represent the number of assets in a portfolio. Then if n is greater than or equal to three, our feasible set becomes this area bounded by this mean variance boundary. This curve is called the mean variance frontier or boundary. And the point on this mean variance boundary that has the lowest volatility is called the minimum variance portfolio. The part of the mean variance frontier that lies above the minimum variance portfolio represented by this red curved line is called the efficient frontier. Any point on this efficient frontier has greater expected return for a given level of risk than any other point inside the feasible set represented by this blue shaded area. Based on two fund separation, the mean variance frontier can be created from any two portfolios on the frontier and the entire efficient frontier can be created by using any two mean variance efficient portfolios. Finally, let's say we have n assets that have identical variance and then there's covariance between these assets. Then the variance of the portfolio that has all these n assets equals 1 over n times the variance of each individual asset plus n minus 1 divided by n times the covariance between the assets. If the number of assets in the portfolio grows really large, let's take the limit as n approaches infinity, then the variance of the portfolio reduces down to covariance between assets. Let me explain what's going on here. As we increase the number of assets, the variance of the portfolio comes down, and that's because of the covariance effect. Each asset has a unique or diversifiable risk, and it has market or systematic risk. So as we increase the number of assets in the portfolio, the unique risks tend to diversify away, and the only risk we're left with is the market or systematic risk. And in our example, that non-diversifiable risk comes in from the covariance between the assets. Note that if all asset returns are independently distributed, then the covariance will be zero and the volatility of the portfolio will also be zero. So this tutorial has given us an overview of what portfolio theory is about and how investors aim to maximize return and minimize risk and they make use of correlations to construct portfolios that suit their needs. We have also seen that Efficient Frontier includes portfolios with greater expected return for a given level of risk than any other portfolio inside the feasible set. And finally, as we increase the number of assets in a portfolio, the unique risks of those assets tend to diversify away, and what you're left with is non-diversifiable risk. If there are any questions or comments, please feel free to post. Thank you.